Hello. What I want to do over the next 10 minutes is to show you some of the results from the drilling that was done by IODP over the last uh, 10 years or so around Asia, and particularly since 2015. And the results reflect the work of several expeditions uh, with m several prominent scientists playing a leading role in developing monsoon records for different parts of the Asian marginal seas. And if you're interested in this topic, I would encourage you to go and download uh, this paper. It's just come out very recently in Scientific Drilling. Uh, it's open access. It's an EGU journal, uh, which summarizes what I'm going to talk to you about now. So what we're interested in here is the development of the monsoon and, of course, the links that were made by people like Peter Molnar concerning the uplift of the Tibetan Plateau, the strength of the monsoon, and then feedbacks on the mountains, whether precipitation by the monsoon might be important in guiding the rate and location of exhumation in the mountain front in the greater Himalayas, for example. So in order to achieve this, we undertook drilling uh, in all the marginal seas around Asia, in the Indian Ocean, South China Sea, East China Sea, Sea of Japan, uh, principally from 2015 until 2018, and including Western Australia. And this, of course, built on earlier work that was done by expeditions by ODP and even DSDP. And in particular, of course, we um, did this in the... Uh, following the work by Dick Croon and colleagues, uh, offshore Oman, uh, where there was this famous upwelling record of Globigerina beloides, the upwelling related forearm that was linked to monsoon, summer monsoon intensity, and which had been a spark for research in other parts of Asia in the South China Sea and the North Pacific. So starting in the West, I want to talk to you about Expedition 355. It looked at the eastern part of the uh, Indus submarine fan offshore the Western Ghats of India. Um, so one of the primary findings for the Arabian Sea was that we see uh, increased seasonality, a drying of the climate starting as early as 10 million, uh, and then particularly again after four, we see a long-term decrease in the degree of chemical weathering of the sediments, and a change in the carbon isotope composition of leaf, leaf waxes pointing to a transition from a more tree-like uh, C3-dominated flora to a more C4 grass-like fauna around 8 million years ago. Moving slightly towards the east, in the Maldives in a sea, drilling by Expedition 359 targeted these large drift deposits, a very asymmetric wind-driven system that was an indicator of the strength and direction of monsoon winds in the central Indian Ocean. And what they were able to show was that the onset of these drift deposits started around 12.9 million years ago, approximately the same age as the redated upwelling on the Oman margin. And also that um, because the onset is very rapid, this suggested that the trigger of this change in the winds was not tectonic, but maybe related to global uh, climate change, and particularly the increased continentalization and establishment of a wind system in the time after the Miocene climatic optimum. Further east again into the Bay of Bengal, Expedition 353 drilled the western Indian margin, uh, the central Bay of Bengal and the Andaman Sea. Uh, what they showed was an increase in clay mineral abundance and the a clastic flux to the ocean starting around 13.9, as you can see here in this reconstruction, and that suggested increased uh, physical weathering uh, at that time, although the sources seem to be relatively constant. There's sort of Himalayan uh, dominance and Indo-Burman ranges in, in modern-day Myanmar dominating, and that this seems to have continued uh, for at least around 27 million years ago. It's quite a long record they got here. And also they found that there was some evidence for there being a dry winter monsoon starting during the mid to late Miocene. In the Bay of Bengal, the central Bay of Bengal, uh, Expedition 354 drilled a number of lobes of the submarine fan in order to derive a complete record. 
uh, you can see that they showed increasing rates of sedimentation in this, at least at this latitude, starting around 18, and particularly after around 12. Uh, there was indeed continuous sand supply from the Himalayas since the Miocene. And we know that older sediments, older than 10 million, uh, have zircon and rutile fission track data that suggest um, a, a derivation from the greater Himalayas, uh, which were exhuming more quickly prior to that time, but then slowed. And we also see then uh, an increase in, in exhumation uh, starting in the late Miocene into the Pliocene, when lag times on these thermochronometers short, shortened again, and this was probably related to the syntaxis rather than climate change. In the South China Sea, the drilling undertaken by IODP was mostly of tectonic uh, significance, but there was uh, environmental records that could be derived from the sedimentary section. Um, and we know that uh, chemical weathering in the northern part of South China Sea, at least, uh, was decreasing since the early Miocene uh, in concert with the falling temperatures, global temperatures. Um, we know that... Um, uh, that, that went along also with um, the oxygen isotope uh, composition of the water, which also suggested um, uh, a fresher water in the late Miocene and then getting uh, less uh, fresh, more saline after around seven, eight million years ago, suggesting a reduced monsoon after that time. We also see maximum seasonality, potentially maximum monsoon strength in the mid Miocene. Uh, here based on hematite gertite records, and that this is broadly consistent with continental data from southern China of the humidity record from Lupen Mountain in southern China. And then I switched to much stronger variations in monsoon, uh, essentially starting in the Pliocene, uh, as typified by uh, the Chinese Lost Plateau record, but also mirrored in the, in the upwelling records in the northern South China Sea. In the Sea of Japan, uh, Expedition 356 uh, looked at um, the oceanography, mostly of the oceanography of the Sea of Japan, as well as a site here towards the south looking at the evolution of the Yangtze River. What was interesting here was that the wind-blown dust that we find in this basin uh, is becoming more and more dominated by material coming from the Lus Plateau uh, and suggesting an aridification of North China starting around four or five million years ago. Uh, and this uh, is correlating with the, the drying trend that we saw further south in South China Sea. Also of interest was the black carbon record from these aeolian sediments that suggested that there was an expansion of the C4 vegetation in Central and East Asia uh, in the late Miocene um, as a result of the global cooling that was going on. Um, finally, uh, there was uh, drilling in Western Australia towards, uh, along the entire margin up until the, the, the shelf in Northwest Australia. This showed a, a, a quite substantially different record. It shows that there was arid conditions that persisted from 16 to about 6 million, so through the peak of the Asian summer monsoon. Uh, there was also work that indicated that there was a, an increase in humidity that maybe started as early as 7 million and that this was linked to uh, migration of the ITCZ towards the south, um, and that this humid phase continued until about 3.3 million uh, when Australia began, began to, um, to dry as a result of a, a stronger winter monsoon and as a result of the continued collision between Australia and uh, New Guinea. So if we look at all the results together, you can see that there are significant differences in the timing of climate change across Asia. Uh, we see this uh, increase in seasonality and uh, drying in the late Miocene in the West, in the Arabian Sea, uh, starting around 10, that there are changes beginning around 4 also to increase seasonality, and that this correlates with um, changes in the carbon isotope uh, in the Bay of Bengal, started slightly earlier. It's uh, also increased hematite gertite ratios of drying in Southeast Asia, um, related in the Mekong Basin, uh, and of course the aridification that we saw in the Chinese Lost Plateau and recorded in the Sea of Japan. 
some of these events correlate with what's going on in Australia. There is this drying that we see in the last few million years in Australia, but otherwise that system appears to be somewhat independent and suggesting alternative controls. Uh, South China itself shows the strongest seasonality in the mid-Miocene and then a drying after that time. So if we look at the complete record across all of Asia of what has now been achieved, you can see that there is a discontinuous but somewhat coverage um, in the Neogene from west to east. The same can't be said of the Paleogene. We have very little coverage in the Paleogene. Only a few records even cover the time of start of exhumation in the greater Himalayas, and almost nothing is known of the early part, the early initiation of the monsoon or the start of India-Asia collision. Uh, so that re represents an obvious target, as do the carbonate records. So we learnt a lot in the Maldives, and potentially the Lacodives Mascarene Plateau might yield similar interesting records in the future. So just to summarise, I hope that I've showed you that we see drying across much of Asia since around 10 million as the, as the Earth gets cooler. Uh, we see a contrast between Asia and Australia with this Australian wet phase between 5 and about 2.5 million. There's this decoupling that is probably related to the Indonesian through-flow. Um, South China is also somewhat decoupled from other parts of Indochina probably related to a northward migration of the ITCZ uh, during the late Miocene. Uh, the drying trends we see in Asia are, however, not synchronous, that in the west, in the Indus Basin, the change from a C3 to a C4 vegetation uh, starts earlier, 7.2 to 7.4, and later in Indochina and the Ganges Basin. Uh, likewise, in Central Asia, the Takli Mount Kan Desert starts in the early Miocene, but the Chinese Les Plateau doesn't appear to dry until the Pliocene. Uh, and in general, there's a lack of correlation between the South Asian and East Asian monsoons, uh, pointing to different drivers. And so it appears that this is consistent with climate models, suggesting that Asian topography steers the moisture, uh, whereas the ocean circulation, and particularly the temperature of the ocean, is what is generating a lot of the moisture in the first place. So supply and steering being two different aspects. And the weakening monsoon is therefore related to a global cooling since the early Miocene. Uh, and therefore it should be no surprise that proxies related to oceanographic productivity don't track those for the continental rainfall. And so basically, uh, we can conclude that wind strength and stratification of the ocean are key to controlling biological production, but they really don't have much to do with supplying rainfall to the mountain fronts in South Asia. Thank you very much.